Welcome to Bowling Shoe Handsome. Playtime's over because tonight somebody's going to get their ass whooped tonight. It is. Hello everyone and welcome to Bowling Shoe Handsome for Wednesday, April 25th, 2012. I'm your host, Kevin McElvaney. Here with you as always, we've got a lot in store for you tonight, including the podcastic return of, that's right, Mike Bessler, plus a musical tribute to polystyrene of X-Ray Specs fame. And up next, we've got a great big old announcement for you here, relevant to fans of Bowling Shoe Handsome from days gone by. But first, some music. back to Bowling Shoe Handsome. You are about to hear part one of this week's interview with Mike Bessler. The topic is the very legit bra Brock Lesnar. Before we get to that, we have, as promised, one big announcement for fans of Bowling Shoe Handsome from days gone by. I'm talking about all of a month or two ago. Of course, the show was not always a solo effort with the occasional guest. Folks, you may recall a man by the name of Young John. 
No? Well, then this is your first time listening, clearly, because Young John was at the very core of Bowling Shoe Handsome, the heart and the soul of the program, very missed by many, uh, most of all by yours truly. And guess what, folks? Next week, to talk about Brock Lesnar and his transition from WWE to MMA and then back again, Young John returns to Bowling Shoe Handsome for one week only. And unless he enjoys it, maybe he'll be back after that. But we'll see where it goes. We're not, we're not trying to be too, too pushy here. Nevertheless, very excited for this, folks, and equally as excited for what you are about to hear. Part one of this week's interview on the topic of Brock Lesnar and my guest, once again, on Bowling Shoe Handsome, Mike Bessler. All right, welcome back to Bowling Shoe Handsome, and we are here once again with the ever-popular Mike Bessler, or Matt Minutia, as he is known in some circles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my alias. Yes, yes. So, how you been, Mike? Um, okay, got a lot of little projects that are keeping me busy and watching a little bit of the current product when I can and probably more of the former product or the product of yesteryear than uh, what's on TV right now, but I am a regular raw viewer, so uh so I think I'm I think I'm up to speed on on everything these days. Okay, good, because I've brought you on to talk about, well, I guess a little bit, to some extent, the product of yesteryear as it relates to the topic at hand. But specifically what I wanted to talk to you about is this whole Brock Lesnar deal, and specifically Brock Lesnar coming on to face John Cena as this quote-unquote legitimate athlete against John Cena, who's the phony baloney wrestler. And in some ways... Sure, this is going to legitimize WWE in the eyes of uh, the few MMA fans who can still be won over. But do you think, uh, point blank, it's a good thing that Brock Lesnar is being advertised as the real deal versus John Cena, who's not quite that? I I don't know. I mean, one thing I know for sure is that it's working for Cena, which is probably more important in the long run for WWE as a company not not as re- not for wrestling as an industry but for WWE cuz okay. he's the cash cow so he's really benefiting from how Lesnar looks uh and is making him look in the whole situation um specifically in what way how is Cena benefiting I think I think people want to pull for him and it's been so easy especially for guys in my demographic to not like him because the women in our demographic do like him, so uh, that's worked against him with you know with with guys for a long time. But I've been finding myself the last couple of weeks, uh, especially coming out of seeing him uh, really uh, you know do what I thought was an impressive job reading uh, following uh, WrestleMania. You know, right. coming into coming into this thing with Lesnar as 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 a pretty strong wrestler. And character, if that right. makes. I, I, I hope Absolutely. you're following me on that. Yeah, yeah. I think he looked. Uh, he he came across great in that feud with The Rock. I think a lot of us were won over in that regard. And it's sort of like Cena has legitimately regained this little bit of underdogdom, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for, yeah, for and, lack of a better word I could make up. But, <laughs> yeah, it it works. I think I think everybody in your audience understood it, and that's the important thing. All six of them. Uh, but, but you know, the, 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 the athlete with credibility has been done before with mm-hmm. Kurt Angle, with, uh, I think, Bobby Lashley to a certain extent. Uh, and, and Lesnar's different because he's just such a beast. And, and it's, it's recent history that everybody saw. I mean, right. how many people who knew that Kurt Angle was an Olympic gold medalist actually watched him compete in the Olympics? How many people watched... Uh, Shelton Benjamin, I think he had a pretty impressive NCAA. Uh, yeah. NCAA. How many people watch that? Everybody knows what's been going on with Brock Lesnar outside of wrestling. Uh, probably more than half of the you know key demographics as far as wrestling fans followed him in UFC. So that's why it's so real. You know, it's it's so recent. It's fresh in everybody's mind, and that's where a lot of the credibility comes from. Right, right. I would I'd be inclined to agree with you on that. Now, how would you compare this to, say, when Ken Shamrock or Dan, speaking of Beast Severn, uh, entered WW, WWF at that time, and they were both former UFC guys who 
WWF audience was probably at least marginally aware were really big in the mixed martial arts world, even though it wasn't quite as big a deal back then. Well, I think I think it hadn't. It definitely hadn't caught fire at that point. Right. And I think in you know the broad scheme of things, yeah, maybe a lot of us remember Ken Shamrock and and know the name, and eh, maybe that's something. But I mean, again, I think Lesnar is just so huge and so over the top, um, and. Eh, and that's why they wanted him, quite frankly. I mean, I, I think, you know, to be kind of the fan and the person who looks at at the bigger picture for the industry as a whole, you look at this and go, why in the world would they bring in Lesnar like this and have his first, you know, big night back at the ring on, on maybe the, the, the C-list pay-per-view, you know, the bottom-tier pay-per-view for WWE. Uh, but they're looking for uh, carry-through. Uh, that they just couldn't get with somebody else, you know, you know, you know, kind of taking it back to Shamrock and 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 the other people in that. I I don't remember it being that much of a turning point or that big of a deal as it was right. first Raw after WrestleMania to have Lesnar come out at the end. Right. Um, so Lesnar sort of striking while the iron is hot from The Rock and got those buys back and apparently 1.3 million buys, which is a record. So I guess they're trying to maintain some of that audience, even though as it seems that Raw's audience has pretty much been the same. Yeah. And, and I don't know. Um, I mean, is, is extreme rules at the end of it, uh, going to be, you know, a really highly thought of event. I mean, I think in a lot of, a lot of respects, it's probably going to be just a footnote, you know. Right. As a fan, I was thinking about this earlier when when you had kind of, you know, suggested that I come on and chat about it. As a fan, I I can't help but go, wow, how cool would it have been if he would have come back at WrestleMania? Then you have Rock and Lesnar at WrestleMania, and how cool would it have been if they would have had Batista come back at WrestleMania? Could have been the best one ever. I don't think that WWE is looking at the best one ever from the fans' ex- uh, perspective. They're looking to continue things out to draw out. Uh, buys and even if they can't get a good spike here, uh, maybe more of a bounce after WrestleMania than they're accustomed to, and that's you know ultimately what it's all about from their perspective. Is it going to be a good match at Extreme Rules? Probably. It would probably be a pretty good fight. Um, yeah. I, I don't know that it's going to be one for the ages though. No, but I, I think it would be decent. I, I do think that Lesnar is going to have to readjust to the ring a little bit, and I have no doubt he's been training. Oh. As not just physically and in the gym and all that, but he's probably been stretching in the ring and getting ready for this match. But at the same time, I mean, it's going to be it's interesting to see this because he's been away for so long. And Lesnar, I mean, if you saw Raw's promo, the, the promo on Raw last night, that was Ten Shades of Awkward. And it was long and drawn out, a lot of repetition, him using the incorrect words, such as how he kept demanding that, uh, that stipulations be – that uh, – the, the demand. demand. He, he wasn't going to do anything until the demand was made. Yes. Made. Yeah. Made. It's yeah. like he just made it, Brock, like 10 times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, that, that was really unfortunate. And I think, yeah. it, you know, you compare that to the packaged promos that they're doing with him, which are awesome. I mean, everything that they did up to that, all the packages that they did looked great. And it was like, wow, I want to watch this guy. I want to see this guy, you know, get this guy back in the ring. But it really was kind of undone with that promo. I mean, they really lost, I think, a lot of momentum going into that pay-per-view. Right. Um, a lot of people are going to buy it because it's Lesnar. Oh, sure. I think uh, probably at least half of, of it won't be inside the ring um, just to just to kind of uh, de-emphasize any kind of ring rust or, or awkwardness there. Uh, but uh, the other question is where does the feud go after uh, after Extreme Rules, I, you know, yeah. maybe that's looking too far ahead because they haven't even had the match yet. But I, I would hope that they have a, you know, more of a long-term plan than just put them out there and and try to drag the uh, drag the company along. Remember, we we still have two guys at the top of the card now, neither of whom has a championship uh, around his waist, and for all we know, they aren't even in the hunt right now. So it's it's kind of an odd time for WWE. Uh, star power is still really trumping, you know, what's supposed to be the most coveted prize for the company. You're listening to my interview with Mike Bessler, the podcastic creator of Matt Minutia, the writer of Five Soul Bowls or Less, 
and the author of articles in various pro wrestling and other sundry publications. I think I got that right. We're going to resume soon with part two of the interview in which you will hear Mike and I talk about John Cena's response to Brock Lesnar, whether Brock Lesnar was his old WWE self or, or if perhaps he had fallen a little short of that on last Monday's edition of Raw, and along with various other topics. But first, we have another song. handcuffs curiously enough from germany up next we have part two as promised of my interview with mike bessler brock lesnar came back they cut this promo that was all kinds of awkward i think you raised a good point earlier saying that he was sort of he was in this highly prepared and scripted mode and while that's not necessarily where the best wrestling promos come from i do think he was very guarded and protected and that he was able, you know, there could have been a hundred horrible takes, and what you saw was just, oh, wow, we captured lightning in a bottle right there. So Mm -hmm. we have it, that's all we need, we're good. Could have been part of the reason why he did it. Maybe just he was having a bad night, finally doing a long-form promo again. Uh, But, you know, it's just, I remember his his promos back when he was with WWE before, when he would actually be out there for ten minutes with a microphone, they were always awkward. He was was best when, you know, when he first started out, he wasn't even cutting promos. Paul Heyman was cutting them for him, and that was for a reason. Was definitely for a reason, and then down the line when he was cutting longer promos, they were not as good as his short, fiery promos. And I don't know, even in UFC, he wasn't up there talking this long before. You know, I mean, I think he was such a, an attraction in UFC because he brought a little bit of that pro wrestling theatricality to it. But he also didn't go on for 15 minutes about stipulations being made and demands that, being made. 
That's true. That's true. And and I think you know maybe he's just not not a good kayfabe promo guy. I still and, and my wife gets really irritated when I say this. Uh, I, I think that Lesnar has the gr- single greatest victory speech in sports history uh, when he won the UFC championship for the first time. The whole uh, Coors Light thing and all that. I mean, I, I thought it was a great moment. Who knows? Who knows if he had thought that one out in his head or if it just kind of rolled off the tongue. But it is a long ways away from where he was last night. And, and, and as you said, I, I mean, I think he looked uncomfortable. I think he had a look about him that was like, I know this isn't going well. Um, and I don't mean that in a kayfabe sort of way. I mean, I think he knew that he was fumbling yeah. a little bit. And, you know, y- you have the guy come out and just put the F5 on, on somebody or, or punch somebody in the mouth or beat Josh Matthews up. I, that, you have him do that for a reason because that works. Um, yeah. they, I can't imagine that, that, that somebody thought it was going to be pure gold or Pure cheddar, to use you know my favorite mm. bowling shoe handsome term, um, <laughs> to to put him behind a mic with Laurinaitis on the other side of it, um, eh, that was a real head scratcher. And I think I, yeah. I'm hoping people are at least second guessing that this morning. Um, you well, know those you those two guys are you know it's like watching the grass grow. Right, right. And did you see any parallels between that and the CM Punk Vince McMahon? contract and list of high demands promo from last year prior to Money in the Bank where he wanted the ice cream bars back, he wanted his face on the turnbuckle Brock Lesnar wants Brock Lesnar wants his name in the title of the show you know, you look at something like that you have to make some comparisons I I hadn't thought of it quite like that and I think because this is the crappy version of that yeah, I mean it, it. It really is. I mean, it's it, that's that's an interesting thought. It, it's a sad thought because I haven't thought of it like that. It's like, well, that worked well. Let's just try the same thing with two different people who have uh, you know Less very different levels skills, of charisma. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That that's that's too bad. Um, I I don't know. It didn't feel quite like a cookie cutter moment. Maybe that's like why it didn't kind of pop into my head. Uh-huh. But uh, even the way that ended with Cena being such a hot promo guy. Uh, he did not come out and I think punctuate that very well either because I think the storytelling in this is unfortunately a little confused. I get where it's supposed to be going. It's just uh, it, it hasn't gelled very well, you know. Okay. Right, okay, and I think that's that's the main thing I'm trying to get at this week and actually I will be talking more about this uh, next week too This is because this is something that's not going to be beginning and ending with the Extreme Rules pay-per-view. Brock Lesnar is back. He's the legitimate real athlete. He's the former UFC champion. John Cena is a big phony baloney pro wrestler. They've done shades of this many times in the past where, you know, but this is real. And Hardcore Holly is a legit tough guy, but he's never won a major (laughs) title, you know. So how can you just expect your fans to believe it's real every week, then say it's not real? Oh, but this is real. But this guy's not, so when he beats this guy, it's going to be really conf- – you know, how do they get away with this, I guess, is what I'm saying. Like, how are we supposed to believe this? Uh, I, I think you know, just the idea of having somebody come back uh, like this I mean, is intriguing in and of itself. You just can't have him come back like every other month. Um, so it has to get more compelling at this point. I, I don't know that they will get away with this or have the buy-in that they need long term. Um, WWE has has botched some pretty big feuds, some feuds with a lot of potential in the past. Um, so that's that's certainly possible in this case, but I don't know that they're at a point right now where there's you know the damage is done and this and this isn't going to work uh, because of how flawed that storytelling is, because of how flawed the whole tapestry is, like you just mentioned, of legit versus not legit, and on and on. Um, I think there's still some room for redemption here. I just don't know if they're going to do it. Right, right. And I think that's a key thing here. They need to make this worthwhile. They need to make pulling that curtain back that much worthwhile. They need to not not make – while trying to legitimize the business, they cannot also serve to delegitimize what has been working for them, what will continue to be there for them long after Brock Lesnar has left. Because even yeah. if – even if John Cena is legit, and even if John Cena can beat Brock Lesnar, is is everybody else not legit? Well, let me let me, let me answer that with a question on your show, where you usually ask all the questions. <laughs> what is the what is the payoff for this feud? 
Um, because I'm not sure I know what it would be. Is it just seeing John Cena beat him once at, at Extreme Rules? It, 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 if you want to see Lesnar win and dominate, is it seeing him beat Cena and then move on to somebody else? Um, is it seeing Cena so Cena's character and credibility so seriously damaged by getting beaten by two people who have been out of the business for years? Uh, you know, where does he go from there? What's the payoff for the, for uh, for this feud? When does it end, and and how does it end in your mind? Once again, you're listening to my interview with Mike Bessler. If you are enjoying this interview or any of the other programming here on Bowling Too Handsome, I would ask that you consider making a donation to... No, I would, I'm not doing that. I would never do that. That's obnoxious. However, uh, I am going to play a song for you here, and then we'll come back and find out what my opinion is about where this whole Cena and Lesnar fiasco goes from here. More importantly, you get to hear what Mike Bessler thinks. But first, some music from Ascetic Parade. was the band Ascetic Parade with Promenade and Raindrops from their debut EP, Durham Has a Skyline 2. And lest you forget what the topic was in the midst of all that wonderful tunage we just played here, uh, Mike Bessler and I were discussing Brock Lesnar and John Cena, and specifically where Lesnar and Cena go from here. And we join, already in progress, part three of my interview with Mike Bessler. Enjoy. 
Don't you answer! As far as what Brock will do, I'm unsure. There's rumors that he's going to ultimately feud with The Rock, a feud that I particularly don't want to see because it's two part-timers, you know, that aren't going to be sticking around. But as far as where, as I, where I see it going for Cena, I see Cena, you know, again, like you said, he's been building this momentum and getting a portion of the crowd that was not necessarily on his side before on his side now because mm -hmm. as much as this crowd thinks Cena's full of crap, they think Lesnar's more full of crap. They were the same people who booed him when he put on that, that – the crap show uh, to keep a PG or PG 13 with Goldberg <laughs> at WrestleMania 20, you know, the same people yeah. who, who, who sang him out, nah, 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 goodbye and all that. This portion of the crowd, honestly, at least appreciates Cena's loyalty to not, not, not to uh, make a pun on his catchphrase there, but that Cena stuck around and that Cena yeah. actually gives a damn about the wrestling business and Brock Lesnar openly does not. And that's not, that's not a character statement for him. Uh, it's a part of who he is, and that's there's nothing kayfabe about that. And I think the crowd gets that, and I think that causes them to pull for Cena, which can help him in the long run, uh, which can in turn potentially help the show. And I don't think that him losing is necessarily a bad thing. We could just see a new take on the old losing streak push where a guy loses and loses until he finally comes back and he's stronger than ever. I, I am a little surprised that coming out of WrestleMania that they haven't been stronger on, on the idea of Brock basically coming in to pick the bones from the feud with The Rock. I think that would have been a really good way to tie those two storylines together, and I don't see that as having happened. I, it, it looked almost like with having Rock come back uh, the, the night after WrestleMania, they effectively cauterized that. Uh, WWE hasn't been real strong on continuity anyway over, over the I'm, last I'm going to have to interrupt you for, for a yeah, second, sure. Mike. I think that may have been the first time that the word cauterized or any variation of that verb has ever been used on a wrestling podcast. Kudos for that. That's, uh, that's <laughs> what I'm here for. I, th I think that's why you asked me on. You know, It, it was. I, I wanted to hear the word cauterized. I, it's, it's I was a certified word. instructor in college writing uh, for University of Phoenix for, for <laughs> this year. And that's true. Uh, <laughs> they might not have me back after admitting it on the podcast, but I d actually d earned money doing that for for a while. That's that's probably a separate topic for another time. But <laughs> I think so. But, but you see what I mean, though, right? I mean, it, it wasn't like there was like a transition. It was just like this is over. Let's go to this now. And I think um, what you're talking about was seen in the ultimate goal there. Um, it could work a lot better had they tied these together, especially you know. If you have him beaten, getting beaten clean by The Rock, and then Lesnar works him over for a while, and there's some back and forth. What might be really cool is if they bring a third guy in after the fact, but that's got to be the one where Cena says, no, you're not getting over on me this time, and you're not doing it like these other two guys did. He hasn't quite done that with Lesnar you know, transitioning in from The Rock, and right. that's the kind of thing I'd like to see down the road however this shakes out. That would be the payoff for me is seeing Cena stronger and a lot – easier to root for uh, coming out of this feud with Lesnar. That's what I want to see. I would like to see that as well. Uh, all right, Mike, I know I've taken up a lot of your time here this valuable evening, this busy evening. Uh, yeah, I've got a, I've got a honey-do list that, like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> all right, well, do you have anything else to add uh, regarding Brock Lesnar and his legitimation? Legitimization. I, I, of wish, WWE. I wish I, I need to give some serious thought to some kind of catchphrase or, or sign off for this show because every time you ask me if I have something else to say, uh, nothing nothing comes up. <laughs> well, I, so, give you the, you know, I give you the general topic of Lesnar, but I, I guess we kind of covered it pretty well. I think you do need the, uh, <laughs> the yeah. sign off phrase. That would be that'd be nice. I, I don't have I'll, one myself, so I should, probably shouldn't expect it of you. Uh, keep it lame, people. <laughs> See, oh, see what, what did I you say? Kind of. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. What was it that you said the last time? I I think I said something like "keep it real" or "rock on" or something horrible. <laughs> so. I think it might have been a, a, a smidgen worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing it up. Hey, WWE's not big on continuity, but at least you are. And that's the important thing. Thanks to Mike Bussler for coming on. We'll be back after some more music on Bowling Shoe Handsome. I heard that hell exists And if I were you I'd take my word for it Cause I only caught a glimpse But it looked pretty intense I'm not a Satanist But her voice sounded like heroin And I got lost in it And I was convinced
And that was the band The Please and Thank Yous with their song Holy Hell. And that was from the album Mind Your P's and Q's, still available for digital download if you are interested and you should be. So thanks again to Mike Bessler for coming on tonight. Thanks as always to him. Uh, He always makes the show a lot more enjoyable for me personally. And speaking of which, as I announced earlier tonight, Young John will be back on Bowling Shoe Handsome next week for one week only talking about the Brock Lesnar and the John Cena perhaps to some extent but mostly Brock Lesnar as it pertains to his transformation from WWE guy to MMA guy and now WWE guy once again I'm very interested to hear Young John's take on this as he knows a lot more about the MMA aspect of this than I do so very much looking forward to that and you should be as well thanks to all of the bands who lent their musical support tonight we're going to end tonight's show with a tribute. Uh, Today is April 25th, 2012. It is the one year anniversary of the passing of Polly Styrene, the singer of the band X-Ray Specs, one of my personal favorites, a band that was hugely influential for me personally, has meant a lot to me. And there's going to be a segment here followed by a very rare tune from Miss Polly Styrene. So I hope you enjoy it. And thanks for tuning in to Bowling Shoe Handsome. Some people think little girls should be seen and not heard, but I think... Oh, bondage! Up yours! One, two, three, four! Okay, it was kind of a cliche to open up with that, but how could I resist? Polly Styrene was a punk rock and cultural icon, far underappreciated during her own heyday, but an icon nevertheless. Influential to everyone from riot girls to garage rockers and punk rockers of all stripes, her band X-Ray Specs was truly one of a kind. They were a band that mixed neon imagery, saxophone whales, and three-chord punk riffs into a postmodern stew that perfectly exposed late 1970s excess and consumerism in a way that is all too relevant to the current decade. And at the helm of it all was Polly. Polly Styrene was a highly capable vocalist who usually opted for a more nihilistic punk rock approach, alternately speaking and shouting lyrics that betrayed her brightly colored ensemble and trademark national health braces. First and foremost, a critic of consumer culture, advertisements, and superficiality, polystyrene was also an inspiration, albeit not deliberately, for women in punk rock. The UK punk scene at the time of X-Ray Specs formation did include some female musicians, but perhaps none so ambitious and visionary as Polly herself. X-Ray Specs soon found its signature song in the 1977 single, O oh Bondage, A Bures. Tyrone would go on record as saying that the song was not meant to be a feminist anthem per se, although it certainly did have that consequence. The song was more about breaking free of the chains of consumer society and again the aforementioned advertisements on the British telly and the radio and the telly and the radio everywhere else. Polystyrene had had enough. The very concept behind X-Ray Specs was an ironic sort of statement about society at the time of the formation of the band and in many ways society today and the superficiality of it all. The 1978 LP, Germ Free Adolescence, followed this theme even further exploring the concept of the bondage of consumerism and the need for possessions. 
Every song from the album followed this theme to some degree or another, and it made for a hell of a wallop. Honestly, if you don't have this album and you consider yourself to be a punk fan, you are missing out. Along on your shelf with Rocket of Russia, London Calling, Machine Gun Etiquette, whatever else you might have there from the early days of the punk movement, if you don't have Germ Free Adolescence, you have an incomplete collection. What might at first seem like a, sort of a proto-new wave album uh, with almost cute imagery at times is actually a really deeply sarcastic commentary on a uh, sort of life that was making polystyrene very, very unhappy. And this was her response. Her response was to get out there and make fun music, uh, this sort of bouncy, almost old-fashioned sounding music that at the same time was really a twisted commentary on what was going on at the time. Okay, so I'm indulging myself a little bit here as the English major who d doesn't get to write papers uh, and write about literature anymore, but you know what? This music is literature. Uh, it is storytelling at its finest, and it's also just awesome, awesome, really moving music. It's intense. It's soft and delicate at times. Other times it's the most intense, nihilistic, crazy punk rock you've ever heard. And all of this was done back in 1978, before the hardcore punk movement, before so much else happened, and yet it's, it's still so relevant today. I just had to say, Polly, from all of your fans, we miss you. This is my half-assed, awful little tribute to you, but you've made a difference in a lot of lives. Uh, when you passed away a year ago, it certainly uh, was a huge disappointment for me. I thought... At some point, I would get to see the reformed X-Ray Specs live. Did not get to do it, but still have your records to enjoy. I'm not trying to sell short your other work here, but Germ Free Adolescence is just that great, and I feel, if nothing else, everybody out there listening needs to know about that. Coming up next, this is actually an unreleased polystyrene song, or not officially released polystyrene song, and this is as... Marie Elliott, or perhaps Mary Elliott, uh, Polly's real name. And you never hear it spoken, so I'm not even sure exactly how it's pronounced, but this is an unreleased unre sort of reggae record that she put out. And with that, I'm going to leave this week's edition of the show with the unreleased Polly Styrene song, Silly Billy. Enjoy. I dare Mrs. Smith.
la la 